he said anybody in the field of the arts, especially in music that learns anything that has any success, owes it to the next generation to do a 180 degree turnaround and show people how you've managed to succeed and, and show them the tools that have helped you gain success. And he said to not do that is a crime of omission. This episode contains adult language and adult humor. Since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults? If you are easily offended by these types of conversations, consider switching to the oboe. Welcome to the Trumpet Gurus Hang podcast. I'm your host, Jose Johnson. This is part two of my epic hang with the great Bobby Shu. Bobby is such a fascinating man and has so much talent and insight that it was impossible to fit everything into a single episode. In part one, Bobby gave us a brief glimpse into some of the early experiences that shaped his approach to learning. In this episode, Bobby takes off the kids' gloves and explains the science of teaching and trumpet. Prepare to have your mind blown. So, pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin. You know, how do you do you, uh, encourage people to get into these kind of steps of critically evaluating uh, the validity of, of what they're doing and, and helping them to, to develop a, their own understanding and approach to their, their, their craft? Well, I think the bottom line on, on the, and the answer, that's a huge question and everything, but how I always revert, I've learned over the years that everything in the physical universe comes down to science. And one of the real problems that we have with, with what you're talking about, why people deny so much of this is that they deny science in so many cases, you know? And I, I have to be somewhat cautious sometimes. Uh, and I hate having to be cautious and pull back on, on speaking the truth and being honest and open and honest about what I, um, um, what I know. And I don't, because I'm, I'm not here to invalidate and step on people's toes, but I, I, I beg for a smarter population. I would love for the world to be smarter than they are, you know? And yeah. if I encourage my students to read, and quite often a book, I'll find a book, um, that I find has really good information that's very valid. And I'll go to Amazon and I'll buy 10 or 15 copies of it used for four or five bucks a piece and send them around. Like Adolfo, many years ago, when he first started studying with me, he's now, he was 18 when he started studying with me. He's like almost 50 now, you know, it's like 31 years ago or something. And I would send Adolfo a book and, and he'd say, he called me on the phone, he'd say, uh, gee, I got this book you sent, uh, and he'd say, uh, did you want me to read that? And I went, oh, no, I wouldn't want that. No, I was hoping it's, I, isn't there one of the legs on your kitchen table? A little? He was like, you know, I said, of course, I want you to read the book. And he said to me, really, like verbatim, he said, well, I'm not much into reading. And I said, well, I warn you, I'm going to try to change that. And it took about four years later, and I got a, a book in the mail from Adolfo that he thought I might like to read. Oh, great. And I got him reading. He was over here yesterday. And you know what? I, I just started reading yesterday, rereading, which I, I read a long time ago, is Dar Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species. Mm -hmm. You know, now, I read that 60 years ago or something like that, you know, and I was astonished by it, you know. And, and I got a new version of it and I'm rereading it. And it's like, and Adolfo saw it yesterday and he looked at it and he went, holy shit, that's heavy, you know? And I said, yeah, but it's truthful, you know? Yeah. I, one of the things that I, I have to be, this is where I have to use a bit of caution sometimes is that in my observation, and if you go back, and read um, enough of the right information, you find that before 
civilization before humanity people discovered that there was such a thing as science they had to try to answer well what's dirt well what's a cloud what's what's this air what's water you know and i mean they had to they didn't know how to answer it right so they they created superstitions mm -hmm. superstitions is mist is is mystical bullshit is what it is it's false data false answers and if you go back far enough and study it you find out that uh this was the origins of organized religion came from that they created such things as gods and heavens and hells and angels and you know and what and wait a minute it's so, organized religion created racism also right it came from that it, po political unrest comes from that and a lot of the people have become reliant upon their so-called gospel, the sermons that they're told by preachers, priests, imams, or whatever. And they go to church on Sunday morning and and somebody tells them what is they're supposed to be the truth and what how they're supposed to live their life. They throw a dollar in a plastic be in the light a candle and then they go go home and have a couple of beers and go make love to their neighbor's wife. You know, wait a second, you know? Yeah. There's no there's no sense of truth and ethics and responsibility and and all of the things that are pertinent to living a good, honest life of creativity and high level of aesthetics and ethics and stuff and people don't people don't even know what ethics are they confuse it with morals and stuff like that you know right and, and these kind of things just if people you can't if you don't read you have no there's no way yeah it's the only way you're going to ever clear up any of these misunderstandings you know and when it comes down to like let's just forget about all the organized religions and politics and all of that stuff. Let's just come back down to teaching a kid to play a trumpet. You know, if you give a person the right information and they realize right off the bat, you have, you're going to have talent. I have, a, I started a little girl in Minneapolis um, just recently uh, a few months ago now, 10 year old girl, and she wanted to play the trumpet during the pandemic. A lot of kids sitting home, they don't know what to do, and they decide maybe, maybe I'll take up a musical instrument. So I've got a bunch of beginners all of a sudden, you know. Oh, wow. And so for this one little girl, I wrote out, she bought a trumpet, we shipped it to her. I sent her a particular mouthpiece I wanted her to play on. I didn't want her playing on a box. 7C, because it's a 10-year-old girl, like, and that's a too big of a mouthpiece for her. Mm -hmm. Energy loss there. You know, the velocity of her airstream is going to drop when it hits that huge bowl-shaped cup that's going to force her to pinch her lips together. So you can track back a lot of embouchure problems to people starting on the wrong mouthpiece. Well, Schlossberg and Harry Glantz worked with, with uh, Vincent Bach back in 1929 or 30, and de determined that a box 7C would be the perfect mouthpiece for everybody to start on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so how, ma how many of us, I did a clinic one time at an ITG thing, and I said, how many of you guys started on a 7C? And uh, the hands went up, there was five or 600 hands went up. Right. I went, good Christ, that no wonder nobody can play, you know? <laughs> and I, in, in the years of teaching, when I see an embouchure setting issue, I can trace it back to a, an improper mouthpiece. And when we have to compensate for the problems that occur from an improper mouthpiece, you don't drive a nail with a pair of pliers. It's the wrong tool for the job. And so I sent this little girl um, an M-shaped mouthpiece, not a bowl. Mm -hmm. Not a flat S shallow piece, but like, you know, and um, I wrote out the fingerings for her. I showed her how to flutter. I showed her how to lip buzz. 
I showed her how the mouthpiece buzzed, drop her jaw, open the aperture. She put the thing, the thing in the trumpet and she went pop. First note came right out like boom. And I gave her all the paperwork and everything. And 10 days later, her father sent me a little video of her playing all the tunes I had written out for her. London Bridge, Mary Had a Little Lamb and Saints Go Marching In. She was playing them all in 10 days and she sounded really good. She was playing up and down the scale and all the chromatic. And all you have to do is show a kid the right thing. Right. If they got half of a brain, they're going to learn quickly, you know? Mm-hmm. So it, this whole process, like the educational system, if you know, there's a great book by F. Buckminster Fuller. Uh, that talks about the origins of education. And there's a funny little analogy. It's just an analogy, but uh, it's about this ancient civilization where before they had discovered like uh, the ability to sail, to go onto the water. And everybody was afraid of the oceans. Oh my God, there's dragons and sea monsters that live in there and all of this superstition once again, you think. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, this, this one little kid in this village uh, is a little a young kid, and he's kind of bright. And he happens to be sitting by a little tide pool by the edge of the water one day, and he notices a piece of wood is in the water, and it's floating. He pushes it down under the water, and it comes back to the top. And he pushes it down, and it keeps coming back to the top. He goes, Jesus. And he goes and gets a bigger piece of wood, puts it in the water, and pushes it down, float. He gets a big branch of a tree, pushes it in the water, comes to the top again. He goes, holy, what? And so he ties a bunch of them together, makes a little bit of a raft kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And he gets on it and it doesn't sink. Oh my God. And he gets this idea like, I'm going out on that water. And, And his king and all the people in his little village, they say, Oh, no, 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 no. You'll go, oh, well, you'll be getting eaten by the monsters. And oh, my. he says, you know what? I got to find out. So he makes this bigger raft and he gets on it and he, he leaves and they're all crying. Oh, my God, we'll never see him again, you know. And he goes out to the sea and he goes around and goes down around the curve and goes a little ways. And he notices, wow, look at there in that inlet. There's a great big cave there. Wow, uh, look at that. And he he pulls over and he goes in and looks at this big empty cave. It's like, wow, look at this. It's great. He gets back on the raft, keeps going. And lo and behold, he comes to another village. And people are going, oh, my God, there's a guy on the sea. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You know, it's a sea monster. They're all afraid. So he comes to shore. They all come up to him. They're terrified. Who are you and where are you? And he's thinking, hmm, let's see now. I could tell them the truth or and they say, where are you from? He says, well, I come from a village just not far from here. They say, really? There's another village? We thought we were the only people on the earth, you know? Oh, no, there's another village. And then and their king says, well, how many people in your, in your village? And there's only 100. But he says, 5,000. Oh, my God, you have 5,000 people in your village. We only have 100 here. He says, but you know what? The king says, here, take some of our fruit, take some of our gold, take some of our handmaidens and give them to your king and tell him we want to be good friends with them. You know. So the kid says, this is great. So he takes it back to the cave. He puts the food, most of the food in the cave, some of the handmaidens. He puts all the, most of there and he goes back to his village. They see him. He came back. But what you got there? You got a handmaiden and some a couple of bananas and a little piece of gold. Oh yeah, I met a, another tribe down the road here and they gave this to me because they want you to, they want to be good friends w- with you. And then his king says, well, how many people are there? And he says, oh, it was about 4,000. Oh my God, well, give them some of our handmaidens too and some of our gold and our fruit. So he goes and he spills up the stash in the cave He's got a fucking game going. He's and this the told story is the original pirates. Okay, 
So he's he's finding other villages and he's working. He's got a game going out there. He's he's getting gold and food and handmaidens from all the villages. Remember, this is an analogy, right? OK, right. so he happens to be back in his own home village at one point. And a few years have gone by and he's really in great shape with all this gold and handmaidens and food and stuff. And he notices a young boy sitting by the tide pool, pushing a little piece of wood down into the, into the water. And he goes, oh, my God, this kid's going to figure out my game, you know. And so he says, hey, you're a smart little kid. You know, you want to come with me and I'll show you what what I've learned. And the kid says, why? Well, yeah, that would be nice. And so he, this guy starts finding smart kids and bringing them into one place and teaching them what he wants them to know so they don't discover what he knows. Right. This is the beginnings of organized religion and education. This is the beginning of the educational system. <laughs> Put the kids, the people into a building, tell them what you want them to know and scare them into not being skeptical about what you show them scare them into not pursuing any further information. Just believe everything you tell them. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? We live in the middle of that crap. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's like uh, there's this uh, definition of wisdom that I've, I've come to, to love. It, it's that um, knowledge, uh, that you can have knowledge, you can have an experience and you can have wisdom that, that knowledge without experience is ignorance. Experience, uh, without knowledge is, um, I can't remember what, it, what, it, 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 but, uh, it's but, dangerous for one yeah, thing. yeah. Uh, but, uh, but, but knowledge, knowledge with experience is, is wisdom. And I think that sometimes that's what, um, that that's what what gets us into trouble is that we we want to give people information but we don't want to let them gain experience with it and that because because if i if i tell you something and and say this is the truth but i don't give you the freedom to to work it and to to see if it works then you know it it keeps me in power you know, it's, it's, you know, I, I think that that's such a, a critical part of, of that, of being willing to allow people to experiment, to, to go out, to fail, to, to see if it works. And if it works, you know, great, it works, move on. You know, if it doesn't yeah. work, then, you know, we, we have to do some, we, we have to, to think about things a little differently. So, I mean, like what you're saying about working with that, that young girl, um, do you, do you see that uh, when you're working with like with pros uh, because you, know, you you have the reputation of being the guy uh, that that, you know, I was trying to explain to a friend of mine who you were, who is not a, a trumpet player. Um, and I said, you know, he's the guy that that the that the pros go to when they've got a problem, when they need something fixed, they go to to see Bobby and they, he goes, oh, he's like Mr. White from. Uh, Pulp Fiction. You're the you're the fix it guy. So, uh, but uh, oh, Mr. Wolf. Mr. He was Mr. White in in uh, in uh, Reservoir Dogs. But anyway, uh, but with with pros, do you see that uh, like the the mental side is getting in the way? I mean, with with a kid, sometimes you can just you know you're you're the authority, so they're going to listen to you as opposed to somebody who's, you know, got 20, 30 years of experience under their belt, maybe they're, they're not getting the results that they want, but do you find the level of resistance when you're making these really kind of uh, fundamental uh, changes or recommendations uh, that they reevaluate their approach? I mean, do, do, you get, do you see a lot of pushback? Well, I get a lot of resistance from some uh, I get a, the biggest amount of resistance from other trumpet teachers quite often who, when they hear me uh, talk about things from a scientific point of view, <clears throat> it goes against what they've been 
you know, dispensing and disseminating for a number of years and claiming to be like da 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 and come to me and you spend one day with me and I'll give you a double C or something like that, you know? And, and what happens is I threaten their, their systematic approach to trying to make money. Why a lot of these people are doing teaching strictly for the money, you know, they're not, you know, they, they want to be able to say, yeah, he's one of my students or he's one of my students and look what I did for him. This is an ego trip for a lot of people, you know, I, 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 one of the things that motivates me and, and keeps me going and keeps me humble and keeps me honest and, and whatever is I read a transcript of a, um, <clears throat> a lecture at Yale University given by Gustav Holst many, many years ago. Okay. And a band director in uh, Lafayette, Louisiana, by the name of Maurice Varnado, who's passed away by now. But he gave me this transcript of this lecture. And it's very interesting. Gustav Holst was a very interesting guy. He escaped the Nazi regime and got over to England and became, you know, a great composer and all of that. But uh, he was a very caring individual. And he's in to, to uh, paraphrase a little bit, one little like, excerpt from this long lecture. He said, anybody in the field of the arts, especially in music that learns anything and has any success, owes it to the next generation to do a 180 degree turnaround and show people how you've managed to succeed and, and show them the tools that have helped you gain success. And he said, to not do that is a crime of omission. Mm. You know, it's like the little old lady that you, you see and needs help and you say, eh, who the fuck is she, you know? Yeah. I mean, or, I don't know who that lady is and maybe she's carrying a gun or, you know, just get over there and help her. And so I read that transcript in about 1968. Now that's what, four or five years ago. You know? mm -hmm. And so when I read that, I thought, crime of omission. I got to look myself in the mirror every day when some kid comes to me and and he say, golly, how do you play? How can you, can you show me how to hit those high notes? Or can you show me how to play a solo like that? Or I'm having my lip hurts or something. And if I don't know the answer, don't lie to him. Yeah. Don't, like the one word that you used uh, numerous times here is the word truth. You were talking about knowledge and wisdom and stuff like that. The one thing that separates this that you have to come down to is truth. And when you come into the, anything in the physical universe from every grain of sand on any beach on the planet to the horn you hold, the mouthpiece, the, the, the pair of socks and shoes you're wearing or whatever, it all comes down to science and everything is atoms and molecules. So if you get as close, that isn't where the art is. The art comes from our human emotions, mm -hmm. from our, our emotional feelings, our, our, our things about all of the difference not only positive emotions, but sorrow, mm -hmm. you know, and all kinds of things. You can't write a sad song about somebody, you know, who I, the tunes I wrote for Blue Mitchell, they were not written like zippity doo They were written because of, of my intense love for this, this person, this friend of mine and his music and how he influenced me. And, and I wrote the second tune I wrote for Blue is called Can't Stop the Crying. You know, every time I think about the guy talking about him right now, why I can feel my eyes watering up, you know, right. mm -hmm. because it, when you stimulate the way that the brain and our bodies and the neuromuscular systems work, we're programmed the gen genome system uh, to react to things like this, you know, mm -hmm. and when I, when I think of something that touches my heart in a sorrowful way, it triggers uh, a, a tearful response, you know, because of that. I do a, here's a funny little drill that ties in with the neuroplasticity and things we were talking about, uh, you know, uh, Daniel Coyle's book earlier, but I tell the students to sit straight 
like just get in the moment and no expression on your face and then pull your corners down like this and hold them down like this. Just hold them down and you will start feeling sad and your eyes will tear up. Mm -hmm. Why? Because when you move those nerves and muscles into that position, it triggers a response in the brain. Oh, he must be sad. So let's put some tears in there. Yeah. And it's all auto autonomic response. Then you stop and then you go neutral. Then you lift your corners up like this. And you don't even happen to be thinking about zippity doo or hitting the lottery. All you do is if you move your corners like this, and you'll start to feel endorphins in your system, you know? Right. You to feel happy. Why am I happy? I don't know. I didn't, you know, but we have so much autopilot stimulus response stuff built into us, you know? And these kind of things are science, and this is truth. And this is, these are the types of things that people need to know. And I, I like the thing because it's, I thought of some silly little thing, but it's, it's true that. Uh, knowledge is knowing that a tomato and an avocado are fruits, not vegetables. Now, how many people know that? But a tomato is a fruit. It's not a vegetable. So is an avocado. It's a fruit. So knowledge is knowing that a tomato and an avocado are fruits, not vegetables. Wisdom is knowing not to put a tomato and an avocado in a fruit cocktail. <laughs> so like, Wait, this, of course, you think yeah. there's a big difference between wisdom and knowledge, you know? Right, right. And, and so when when you can have a lot of information, which can be considered to be knowledge, but it may not be truthful information, you know? And, yeah. you know, you can read a book about trumpet mouthpieces or you can read something like that. I and mean, you're going to get somebody's opinion about, oh, if you're not playing a monad trumpet, you'll never get a job, you know? Wait a minute. That's bullshit, you know. It's not truth, you know. Yeah. There have been yeah. there are people that had jobs before that horn and they're gonna be people have <laughs> jobs after it. So do you do you know the the uh the story about the the five uh the five or uh, sometimes five, sometimes six, the blind men and the elephant is an old uh like eastern story. It's been like traced back in the Hindu traditions and like that. It's a, the 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 group there's a there's a group of, of blind men uh, they have never experienced an elephant. They don't know what an elephant is. They've just heard about it. And uh, they find out that this elephant is being brought into their town. And they decide, well, we're going to go. And we're going we're gonna to see what this elephant is all about. And they decided that each of them would just experience the elephant and share their experience. So one guy touches the elephant's trunk and goes, oh, the elephant's like this big snake and then another one touches the you know grabs the leg and it's like it's like it's big tree and yeah you know, on and on and on and so the bottom line is that each of them is experiencing a, a portion of the elephant and their understanding of the elephant is partially true but it's not the whole truth because they can't see it and put it all together so uh with i think with, with you know this is in, in life and trumpet playing and it, it's all the same thing is that we only know things from our unique perspectives. You know, the, the things that, that, that we have experienced the, personally, the, the knowledge that we've gained through our own studies, um, that gives us our unique perspective. But we're all searching to put all of that together. And I think this is why Adolfo was, was saying, like you and I, you know, we have this kind of kismet of, uh, of sorts, you know, in terms of our approach, is that, it's about, I think we both have this desire to find as many facets as possible, to experience as many facets, as, to gain knowledge from as many different sources, and then stitch it together to create a truer picture of what it is, as opposed to, you know, this is only what I know, this is only what I've experienced. You know, we actively search for for new input. And um, I, I think what you were saying is, is so crucial that I th that so many teachers are afraid. It's an ego thing. They're afraid to allow students, because uh, I saw some of martial arts uh, practice and teaching, they're afraid to let their students 
learn from other people, to talk to other people, to experience from other people, uh, because they're afraid that, that their lack of knowledge will actually be shown, as opposed to saying, hey, this is what I know. I don't know it all. Uh, you know, so go out and experience. And hey, if you learn something new, how about sharing it with me? Because I want to improve. So um, and do you, I know that you continue to, to learn. So I'm, I'm going to ask you this, this question. Um, what's the newest discovery that you've made that, you know, that, that you can go, wow, this is, this is something really cool and this is going to make an impact on, on you as a player and as a person? Well, I think one of, the, one of the things that I've got an awful lot of attention on at the moment has to do with the book I mentioned to you, The Breath by James Nestor, you know, because uh, the last chapter in the book, he go, it's got like numerous different yoga breathing things, ones that pertain to elongated meditative kinds of processes. Other ones are very brief kind of things like I was telling you about the little five step thing, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and in addition to that, do you know who uh, Wim Hof is? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the the guy that the cold the water man. and snow and ice and all yeah. that. You know? uh -huh. What <laughs> one of my dear friends is Shunzo Ono. Do you know Shunzo? Who he is? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, he's a great Japanese jazz trumpet player. Lives in New York, not in the city. Lives in up upstate New York a little bit, but. Uh, Shunzo just bought a flugelhorn from me, and what he sent me an email about <laughs> about something and a text rather, and in the text there's a little video and I click on it, and he's out there and he's got on a pair of swimming trunks and he's laying in a foot of snow, and he's on his back and he's packing the snow in on his body on his legs and everything and his head and the whole thing. And he lays there in the snow, like the Wim Hof process, you know? Right. Uh -huh. And how that builds up your immune system and everything, you know, mm -hmm. from ancient times. And he, he, he lays there in the snow. So like he got the flugelhorn a couple of days ago. And now I got a text from him yesterday and he's, he's laying in the snow when he's got the flugelhorn in, in the snow <laughs> with him, you know, I mean, but this whole thing about breathing uh, and Wim Hof and all of these things. Now, I, in spite of the fact that I, I can understand this, I'm not about to go out and jump in the snow. Mm -hmm. uh, I, when I was 18 years old and I went to Chicago for the first time, I jumped in Lake Michigan. That was a mistake. <laughs> I had no idea what cold water was like, we got plenty of lakes here in New Mexico, and I'd been in quite a few of them, but we're different than, yeah. than Lake Michigan. And man, I didn't know. I hit that water. It was like painful. Mm -hmm. It was in and out of that lake so fast, you can't believe it. I was like almost in tears, you know. What the hell is wrong with that water, you know? And, uh, but anyway, uh, th this whole thing that I've, I'm always discovering new things about the respiratory system and breathing. And, and I, I heard an interview with, um, with Wayne Bergeron just recently, just a little while ago. And he's, he's has studied with me a bit over the years and not a lot, but Wayne Bergeron could play a double C when he was 13 years old from the DCI programs and stuff like that. He mm -hmm. didn't know how he was doing it, except that Wayne is a very determined individual, you know? Yeah. He, he has a sense of, uh, of uh, application of overcoming problems and weaknesses in his playing that he, you want to get out of his way when he decides to learn something, you know, <laughs> I mean, yeah. he's going to do it. He may not always do it. And this happens with a lot of people, they get a determination to overcome something and they may not have the most scientific uh, efficiency approach to doing it, but they're going to get it done one way or another. And mm -hmm. the danger with that is that their determination sometimes forces them down a wrong path and they, they create some bad habits and right. they've got like something now that 
in later years, it's going to have to be, it's going to be uh, an obstruction to their success. But I, a lot of times I hear people talking about breathing and they say, oh, well, breathing is not that important, you know, and I'm going, what the hell are you talking about? I mentioned it earlier, but I keep coming back to these science things. And and the, the one thing that I always try to, to do is just say, I'm, I'm going to stick as close to science as I possibly know how. I'm not science. Uh, some of my scientists, scientist friends, I have a lot of friends who are brilliant scientists and play a musical instrument. A lot of them play trumpet. I've got a great physicist in, in Victoria, British Columbia, who's like a world-class physicist, plays the shit out of the trumpet. There's a guy who lives up in Santa Fe who is absolutely a brilliant physicist, goes all over the world doing structural things with NASA and all kinds of stuff like that. I, I got a bunch of these guys and I always refer to them scientific materials and I have them qualify as, am I on the right path with this? And they, they might question it. They might re remark something I'm missing this or whatever, but they'll always help me and make sure what I want to do is make sure I know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just blabber a bunch of false data out to people, you know? Right. Because I mean, somebody's going to know it's false. You know, I don't want to be saying shit that's not true, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm my own worst police officer in that regard, because I, I try to make sure I know what I'm talking about. And sometimes it's difficult because I'm not like, I'm not a genius or anything like that, you know, I, but I do tell my students, I said, you know what, if you, you can be as smart as you want to be and you can, you can be as good as you want to be too on the horn. But if you don't want to be, you have no self-motivation, you know, there's a thing that somebody asked me about, about the teaching process, you know, and as I mentioned to you earlier, I've written articles about, do we really teach people? Is there such a thing? But what I think it's all about is, well, I, I was talking to a, a local saxophone player here in Albuquerque, and he's, a, he's not a band director or anything. He teaches private lessons in a music store or something like that. But we were doing concerts and none of the None of the school kids would ever come to the concerts. They were free, afternoon concerts, free on a Sunday afternoon. And I said to the band directors, the whole Albuquerque Jazz Orchestra is almost all band directors, junior high, high school, elementary, college, whatever. I said, do you guys tell your students about these concerts? that We don't ever see kids coming. And this saxophone player says, I have a hard time motivating my students. And when he said that, I went, the guy doesn't understand his job. You know, you're not supposed to motivate your students. It, motivation has to come from within. If, if you have to motivate your students, you're telling them, you better practice an hour a day and have your mom sign a piece of paper that, that says that you did, prove to me that you practiced. And so I took a look at this process. It's a three-stage process. This is my opinion, okay? Mm -hmm. But I think it, the, the whole thing starts with passion which is an emotion of love of that's where the art is. That's where the music is, you know? Mm -hmm. So a so-called teacher that has a very deep passion for music is he says to the kids, Oh kids, Hey, wait, listen. Oh, wait, wait. If you've never heard Count Basie, listen to this. Oh my God. Wait, do you hear this? You know? Oh my, you never heard Chet Baker. Oh my God. Wait, do you hear this guy play a ballad? Oh my God. You know? or whatever, I don't care whether it's mariachi music or whatever, but show it to the kids like you care about it. And their kids are gonna go, my God, Bobby really loves this shit, man. He really is, my God, it's unbelievable. Bobby's like so in love with music, you know? Yeah. And what happens is from passion, that inspires them. So passion, inspiration. Inspiration, they go, God, 
I'd like to be in love with music too. And then from inspiration comes motivation, self-motivation. Mm-hmm. So a kid get, is inspired. If you can't inspire a kid, then you can't expect to motivate him. You have to do it as a forceful thing. Mm-hmm. And the only way that the, the really way to turn out a really good musical program in a school or anywhere is to show the love, the meaning, the true depth of the meaning of the value, the joy, the spirituality, the the finding your voice going inside of yourself. Music, I've written an article about it, The Origins of Music. It's an ancient form of prayer and chanting. You know, and when we had a mystery, we went, what the heck is this? Boom, 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 boom. We found rhythms. We found things inside of ourselves that a form of prayer. We didn't know. We went inside. What? Why do I feel this way? Oh, you know. Oh, and it became a song or it became a chant or something. So if you, re- if you realize that the origins the depth of the origins of music. And you can present that to the kids and say, you know, kids, it's okay. I don't care if you miss a note. We don't want to miss notes, but you got to, if you know, if, if Michael Jordan or Shaquille O'Neal first threw a basketball up and missed the net and you took a stick and hit him over the head, we'd never, they'd have never been a basketball star. You can't, invalidate somebody for missing a note or making a mistake. There's no such thing as a mistake. A friend of mine, a piano player up in, the, in Washington state was a state representative for, for the state of Washington. And he wrote a book called, there's no such thing as a mistake, you know? And the truth about it is when you miss a note, it, there's a reason for that. And if you can know, and you were talking about analysis and evaluation and stuff earlier, you know, with the knowledge, wisdom thing, these steps, when you have, when you miss something, you have a need a checklist. And if you're playing, you know, but you, it sounds like crap and you, well, the first thing is you want to check, like, what do you feel like? I mean, did, did you get a good warm up? Is the functional thing happening here? The setting working? If that's okay, then check your breathing. If you're supporting from down here, that's fine. If you're not, then you're going to be playing from up here. That means you're going to be crunching your chops together. That's probably why you miss. But if that is okay, then you got to check, you know, you check your air. Then you got to start checking the setting. Are you using air pivoting? Or do you understand? Are you controlling the aperture? As, as you go up a scale, your aperture has to reduce in size or it's always changing depending on the two things, the register you're in or the dynamic. And so if, if you check this checklist, you can find what it is. And so, move the aperture. It's aperture control. Oh. Now you can play. Yeah. And if you, if you have the right checklist, if you say, well, it's not a con. I'm playing. I, I, they told me if I don't play a con trumpet, I, it won't work, you know. Yeah. Or, I, need a, I need a Wynton Marsalis model mouthpiece, you know. Yeah. Get yeah. the hell out of here with this crap. And there's so much. I go back to the beginning of when we started here. There's so much dissemination of false data that puts people down the wrong path. It makes them buy the wrong horn, the wrong mouthpiece, play the wrong way, practice the wrong way, think about the wrong things, worry about the wrong shit. It's okay to miss notes, but not forever. Yeah. Not without solving the problem. Right. right. And my job as a so-called teacher is to give truthful information to a student that enables him to go in a practice room and solve his problems. I've written how many numerous articles about you are your own best teacher, you know? Mm -hmm. Self-teaching is what it's all about. I mean, nobody, I never took a trumpet lesson in my life, but I have certainly studied the trumpet, Mm -hmm. you know? 
a lot more than a lot of trumpet players have, you know. Right. <laughs> and right. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't. Sometimes you can go to certain teachers, and I think just because the guy's famous doesn't mean he's a good teacher. It's like uh, the the best basketball player is not always the best coach. Exactly. You know? Sometimes it's actually the, the 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 one who does who has the least amount of what we want to call talent. You know, the the star potential. Those those are often the greatest coaches because they're the ones that had to figure shit out. You know, they're, they're they're the ones that that had to to really think about processes and not just you know kind of skate by on on their their natural abilities. Well, I think that includes me because I'm not a very good trumpet player. The and when people smile and laugh and giggle when I say that, but a a good trumpet player would be a highly skilled player. He could do all the trumpet things. He could double tongue, triple tongue. You could slur all over the place. He had extreme register and transposing and playing C trumpet and E flat and an F trumpet and all of these things and the only knowledge of a trumpet. But see, I'm not very good at that, but there's a difference between being a trumpet player and being a, an artist. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm a hell of a lot better of an artist than I am a trumpet player. And I remember a book in philosophy talking about technique. I read, this was about 1968. And uh, this philosopher was talking about in the field of the arts, how much technique do you need? to be a good artist, you know? Well, it depends on what your vision is. Like if you're a Salvador Dali, you better have some really good technique. If you're doing Michelangelo and doing the Sistine Chapel, you know, you better have some technique. If you're a Jackson Pollock, Jack the Dripper, as they used to call him, you know, if you get up on a ladder and start throwing paint across the wall, or onto a big thing on the floor, how much technique do you need? You need the technique to paint what it is you envision. If you're, if you're doing a landscape of a beautiful thing with the mountains and trees and a forest and deer standing in the grass and all that, you better be able to paint those things. Mm -hmm. And you have to study and gain the technique that's necessary to get onto the canvas what you see here. As a musician, it's what do you hear? Mm -hmm. in, and if you spend all of your time uh, as a jazz musician, if you want to play jazz, and like in my case, I don't want to be a classical trumpet player. I love listening to classical musicians. I love listening to classical trumpet players. I mean, I've had a lot of good ones. I remember Hoken Hardenberger's coming to clinics and taking lessons with me when he was in in uh, Gothenburg, Sweden, when he was about 14 years old. And a lot of these guys like that, I've known them since they were extremely young. You know, I heard Wayne Bergeron play when he was about 15 years old with his high school band. I was judging his band mm -hmm. in Costa Mesa, California. You know, and I've heard these kids grow up, you know. Uh, but I, the most, nat, most, most natural thing in the world for me is playing jazz. You know, I grew up playing. I did my first gig for a wedding when I was 12 years old. I could improvise immediately because I just had a natural sense about it. Um, and I, I went home and I started buying jazz records and I listened and I transcribed by ear, I played back, I sang back and forth. Over the years, I've learned things like idiokinetics, connect ear to finger stuff, you know. And uh, I watched John Coltrane practice on the, on the airplane and on the bus with just his fingers and no saxophone, just fingering what he heard in his head, you know. I went, shit, you know, and uh, Anyway, uh, the whole idea about it is that as a, as a jazz musician, uh, I go that direction, you see. I don't, if, if I open up the Arvin book and start playing, da -da 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 -da, it interferes with my head. It does, I'm putting things in there that don't apply, mm -hmm. you know? 
uh, if you've, I don't know if you've, you probably have heard all of the Clifford Brown practice tapes, I'm sure. I've you heard know. a few of them. Huh? I've heard a few of them. Yeah. Well, there's, there's his wife, LaRue was a really good friend of mine and uh, Blue Mitchell introduced me to her mm -hmm. in 1972. And, we became good friends and I went to her house a lot and she opened up the piano bench and showed me a whole bunch of Clifford's tunes all in his own handwriting and the books and stuff. And mm -hmm. I got caught photocopies of some of them and things like that, you know, but uh, if you listen to Clifford practice, he would take things like, you know, uh, well, I don't know if I can play play, but you know, if you take something like Clark studies or Arvin studies, and if you play them the way the traditional da, 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 like that, does that really apply to Clifford Brown? Fuck no. So what Clifford did is he used the pattern, the fingering patterns, but he uh, did the articulations and sound and style to fit, you know. You know. Right. You know, th that kind of approach to it has no application. Right. So I mentioned earlier in this conversation about practical application. You know, why would a jazz player want to practice classical music? I sometimes will tell a student, you know, so, you know what? What do you practice? And he says, well, I got the Clark and the Schlossberg and, and then the Arbens and then I do this and then I do. I'm saying, for Christ's sake, why don't you? Take all those trumpet books, put them in a box, put tape, type tape or tie a string around them or something, put them on a high shelf in the garage and leave them in there for about six months and go play shit that you hear. You know, play stuff that's honestly inside of you. Play that and get good at what, who you, who are you? Mm -hmm. as a player, you know, find yourself in the ancient halls of learning in Greece, they said, as you enter and said, know thyself, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, so, yeah. you know, find your vote, finding your voice is like a very critical thing in music, you know, and whatever it is, people who do studio work, you have an eclectic situation here where you have to three hours, you play it, you're playing rock and roll here. You play Mork and Mindy there. You're playing a Burger King commercial there and you have to be, <clears throat> multi-skilled you know yeah if that's what you want to do and i ended up i didn't want to be a studio musician but i got called to do it and people kept saying well bobby's this and he's he can do that and i could do most everything fine but every once in a while i got called into a session for something and i look and i turn the page and there's some double turning or some shit like that i went oh well, the first rule is pass it to the guy that can play it. Uh huh. You know, don't sit there and let your ego get in the way and say, oh, I have to try this. Well, that, if you become a, take, a two or a three take player, you get on a list and the contractor says, forget him. Mm -hmm. you know? When we did the Tony Randall show, he played a judge in the show and, and uh, Pat Williams did the writing for it and Sammy Nesco did all the ghost writing, but the theme song had a piccolo trumpet thing in it. And I got there for the first session. And I went, there's no fucking way. I can't play the piccolo trumpet. So I handed it to Nelson Hat. He played it perfectly, you know? And it didn't matter to me. All I want to do is get the session done and get the music done the way Sammy and Pat Williams done. It doesn't matter whose name is on that part, right. mm -hmm. you know? What matters is, is, when you get self-importance, which is the best definition of ego, when you let that get in the way of your playing, you're in serious hot water. You yeah. you are up that famous creek without that paddle, you know. And the thing about it is, uh, uh, Dalton Smith used to say to me, Bobby, there's a great exercise that if you do that exercise every day, man, your chops last forever. And I said, really, what's that exercise? And he says, here, you play this and you play that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. I do, you know, I mean, yeah. I survived uh, many, many years of being a studio player 
and I got caught a few times and boy, I had to bullshit my way through double turning on a television movie one time. And thank God I went and listened to Kenny Dorham and Blue Mitchell and all those guys when I was a kid and I learned about false fingerings and I went, so instead of double tonguing, I went. You know, and it fooled the guy. He thought I was double tonguing. He never knew that I wasn't. You hey, know. I got the job done. That's why he walked out of the studio, takes the check, and get the hell out of there. You know. There you go. There you go. Well, yeah, I, I man, I could talk about all this stuff like for for centuries with you, uh, but I, got, I I have to do some trumpet related, like some some trumpet gear stuff. I mean, I, I'm going to catch so much shit from people, but you know, hey, screw you. This is my show. Uh, but. <laughs> Uh, I do have two segments that we need to get to uh, before we wrap it up today. So the first one is actually about gear. It's called Gear Up. And uh, just, you know, kind of quickly kind of touch on, on what what you're playing these days. And, and I know the answer already, but uh, for people who might be interested in knowing what kind of gear you work with. And then I actually want to know kind of, you know, the backstory on on why you feel that what you play on is important. Well, uh, <laughs> I mean, of course, I've been with Yamaha for 46 years, and and I, I had to, that was one of the most humbling experiences in the world, is we were in Tokyo with Toshiko's band on the first tour over there in 1974, I think it was, yeah. And <clears throat> two guys from the Yamaha company, uh, Kenzo Kawasaki, who is the head of the R&D, in band and orchestra, <clears throat> and a young kid about 20 years old by the name of Hiro Okabe. They were backstage at a sound check. And, and we came off and, and they came up to me and said, uh, you know, we're we were we were with the company, we are starting to build some horns for a pro level. We don't have anything yet. Would you be able to come help us and try some models and give us some opinions? So I did. I went down to the Ginza shop and I tried some horns and they were mostly copies of different things, copies of box, copies of this and that. One of the things they had copied was Bob McCoy had given them an old Martin committee model and they had copied the committee model. And the committee model, as you probably know, was co-designed by seven different people, seven famous Holton and Olds and Shulky and all different people at all. I don't remember who all seven were. They were all contributed to the model of this horn. But what happened is uh, it the horn, when it first came out, it was so excited. Everybody was excited and everybody bought one. And six months later, they were all getting rid of them, you know, mm -hmm. because the horn had problems. Well, I tried the copy of the Martin Committee model and it was terrible. But I was playing an old P12L in those days, large bore olds, really nice horn, but hard work, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was starting to get respiratory problems again because of age and smoking. I made the idiotic thing of smoking cigarettes for a lot of years. That's the stupidest thing I've ever, I've done some stupid shit in my life and nothing worse than, than smoking cigarettes because I mean, I smoked some weed, you know, and stuff, and at least I got high, you know? Yeah. I, I thought it was Charlie Parker for a minute if I smoked a joint, you know? But <laughs> when you smoke a cigarette, all you do is just, you're just driving nails in your coffin, you know, yeah. with that shit, you know? But anyway, um, so the, I kept coming back to this this young, this uh, copy of the committee model, and it it felt stuffy at first but i realized i was overblowing it and i finally backed off on it and all of a sudden it started responding it still had some problems but they gave me a copy of of it and i brought it back to la and people were in the sessions they said what the hell is that trumpet you're playing japanese oh my god you're playing a japanese trumpet and i said well try it and then they go shit where can i get one of these <laughs> you know and all of a sudden it started this thing and they weren't making the horn yet, but they made 100 and 110 of them and sold them to everybody from Roger Ingram to, 
you know, people all through the studios and stuff and all over right. the place. And then it became a model, the Z model, you know. And then, oh, you know, the history, it's, I'm still playing it. I'm, the horn that I'm, they normally play, I mean, the one I'm playing right now, this is a Z. Uh, it's a, um, it's a, um, it's an 8310Z. Yeah. I have a lot of them. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's a dozen or so different Z trumpets laying around the house. In every room, I got a different trumpet, you know, with the mouthpiece in it, not in a case. So I can pick it up and just play it in an instant. Right. I play that horn because it's the most efficient horn in the world that I've ever played. I had a collection of 136 instruments recently, and I've been selling them. I'm down to about 30 left. Um, but I had everything from Queen on flugelhorns to I have I had Martin committee models, a whole bunch of those. I had I had Conrad Gazzo LeBlancs, all that this, I mean, really an amazing collection. Mm. I've sold the majority of them, not all, but close. But um of all of the horns I had, New York box, everything, none played as good as this. And I tried them. I'd take them on a gig and play them. I'd say, what the hell am I doing? This is hard to play. And I'd go back to the Z trumpet. The Z trumpet has outsold every trumpet on the market. You know, it's they've sold over 700,000 of those things. Oh, my gosh. And I wish I had a dollar for every one they sold, but there's no royalty from Japan, you know? I'd but, take 50 cents on the dollar for that one. Yeah, that's right. I would take a dime. But the thing about it is they... And even they got a new custom two out, just came out last year, and they can't make enough of them. Even with with the COVID thing, manufacturing numbers are down because they they have to be a little cautious and numbers of personnel and all the considerations. But they can't make enough of them. They can't keep them in the store, and you know, people are are waiting for them. Thing is, I play that horn because it's. For me, for what I when I was playing full time, that thing was the easiest thing for me to play lead trumpet on. I could just soar all over it. The double C was always right there without without my testicles ending up in my throat, you know. And uh, it was it's a very efficient instrument. And then the sound was exactly what I wanted. When I turned around and put some different mouthpiece in it and played jazz on it, I got exactly the sound I wanted, you know. Um, Philip Smith, years ago, there's a great story about him. I don't know him personally, but they told me this story. And he went, he went to the New York Atelier to get a B-flat trumpet in. He, he needed a B-flat. He didn't have a B-flat. So he went into the Yamaha Atelier and... So they pulled out a bunch of things like the Xenos and all of those types of things, which are kind of copies of the box and right. whatever. So he, he played a Z trumpet and he kept going back to the Z and everything. And he, he finally said, it's amazing, you know? And so the guy there at the atelier said, well, if you like that trumpet, he says, we'll get you one. He says, Oh no, no, I would never play that trumpet. And they said, well, why? We thought you liked it. He said, oh, it's far too easy to play. <laughs> I said, there's your ad right there. Get a picture of Philip Smith saying, oh, this thing's, don't play this horn. It's too easy to play. You couldn't make enough of them, you know? Oh, and, my gosh. That's a great story. <laughs> but see, the thing about it is he, his body was on a neuromuscular pattern that was accustomed to playing a different kind of response and resistance. Right. Mm -hmm. and he didn't want to have to rechange his whole playing thing to play on just that one b flat thing he had it was not his career and right. so that's why he didn't play it but i thought oh, what a comment from a guy like philip smith you know yeah. you, you know well when, you know, I, play, I play that horn and the flugelhorn as well you know we designed a good flugelhorn we're actually just we're starting on a new flugelhorn now for yamaha and uh they keep wanting to upgrade different things in the technology of manufacturing of uh, making things from one piece to two piece and 
lightening up the bell here and changing the braces and getting rid of the lead solders and they keep, but the horns are consistent. And that's one of the things that I like about it is that they have so many people working in R and D and Hamamatsu, you know, that if you compiled all the people that worked for all the other companies and put them together, you'd still have less people than are working in the Yamaha factory, you know, wow. they have this massive thing. It's like you walk into this compound. It's like, it's like Fort Knox for Christ's sake. It's got high walls around it and security guards and everything. But yeah, well, that's that sounds great. And and, so, and then the other thing is with the mouthpieces too. You know, I the mouthpieces that I play on uh, the trumpet they, mouthpieces, right? Well, they had a guy with the with the Yamaha. He's left them years ago. He retired, but he helped me. We took some of the mouthpieces that I've been playing, some old Jardinellis and stuff, and we made some slight revisions in the backboard and the throat and, and, and the bite on the, you know, inner bite and so forth. And, uh, those mouthpieces sell like hotcakes. I'm telling you, they're worldwide. They're they, the Bobby shoe jazz and lead mouthpieces and the flugelhorn mouthpieces. They sell like crying out loud. And, you know, they used to give me a buck 75 for each mouthpiece that they made. But it was a difficult thing for them to keep up with the numbers and everything. So they, they just bought me out. They gave me a big fat check to just own the rights to it all. I said, whatever. Fine for me, you know. But They own you, Bobby. I, huh? They own you. They own you now. <laughs> yeah. I know you can't yeah, use, you can't use your own name anymore. You have to you have to be like Prince. You know you you have like a, a symbol for your name now. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I don't know, man. I just I just think that you know there's some people with the Yamaha company that I don't like, and there's a lot of them that are like more interested in there's some ego things over there. But for the most part, it's a really wonderful company to work for and worth. I'm lucky that I have. My biggest connection with that company is Bob Malone. And, and I was with Yamaha long before Bob Malone was ever there. Mm -hmm. uh, but what he's done for that company has been miraculous, you know? Yeah. A lot of smart people in the business, as you well know. Yeah. Well, when I, when I first met you back there in, in uh, Sao Paulo uh, with Terry, God, I've known Terry Warburton for, Jesus, how many years? I don't know. A lot of years, you know. Lots of years. Yeah, a lot of years, you know. And, uh, and you know, I used to have a, I bought a whole big collection of, of uh, mouthpieces, the big tray of mm -hmm. all the cups, the interchangeable cups and, yeah. and back bars and the three-piece things and all that. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I had that big kit. <laughs> from him for years, long, long time before he had the fire and all of that stuff, you know? Yeah. And Terry's a, he's a unique character. I love his sense of humor and all of the comical things that he comes up with, but he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a great guy. I mean, he's a, and he's a very talented cat, very knowledgeable and so forth. Yeah. It's never a dull moment. Never a dull moment. All right, we're going to do our, our last segment here, Bobby. This is a okay. uh, this is a segment that uh, is sponsored by uh, my good friend uh, Kenny Robinson with Robinson's Remedies. We call it the Robinson's Remedies Rapid Fire Round, and it's a series of uh, questions I'm going to fire off to you. They're going to be all over the place. I just want your most immediate, quickest answer to these, uh, so we get a, a look inside the mind of Bobby Shue. So, uh, are you ready? Sure. All right, here we go. First question. Who's the biggest influence on your life that's not a trumpet player? Carl Sagan. Hmm. What's your favorite book? My favorite what? Book. Book? Book. Oh. I, know you, I know you read, so. Yeah, there's a whole lot of, little, but I, one of the reason, one of the most recent books is the Demon Haunted World by Carl Sagan. That's one of the top 10 books I've ever read in my life. Okay. What is the worst movie you've ever seen? The latest Star is Born with Lady Gaga. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't watch it to the end. It was so sickening, you know. Uh, if you weren't a trumpet player, what would you want to be? 
an architect. Hmm. What's your favorite drink? Drink? Yes. Uh, I don't know, probably. Well, I, one of the things I really like is, uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, I can't think of the name of it. It's a Brazilian drink. Uh, what's that? Cap, uh, Caparina? Huh? Caipirinha. Yeah. We had we had a few of those when we were in Sao Paulo. Oh yeah, the caipirinha. That is a, yeah. that is one of the. And the the only other thing I would compare that to that is a uh, pisco sour mm, yep. in Peru. Another good one. All right, um, you could have a you're going to have a dinner party, and you can invite any three living people in the world. Any three people can come to this dinner party. Who would you want to invite? Oh boy. Kim Novak, Audrey Hepburn, Raquel Welsh. Are they all still alive? No. <laughs> but Bobby. <laughs> be alive. Well, I said that any three people alive. Any people three three yeah. alive people. Those three those are the three women I'm I've had a mad crush on my entire life, you know. Oh. I felt recently that Paul Desmond had such a crush on Audrey Hepburn that he used to leave the jazz club and walk over to the theater so he could stand outside the door and watch her exit after the show. <laughs> but, no, of people uh, that are alive, let's see, God. I don't know, man. I mean, that's a hard one. Yeah, I don't know. I, that's why it's the tough questions, man. Well, that's a tough one because I prefer to dine with just my wife, you know. Okay, we'll give you that. All right, so uh, the, the the second part of the question was, you know, you could invite any three people from history, uh, but where are you going to invite Audrey Hepburn? And well, I would love to have had some time to sit and speak with Carl Sagan, for one person. He's one of the smartest individuals I think I've ever read in my life. Um, I, I really love reading. I'm reading everything that he's written and he keeps, he knows how to put all of the truth right on the table. Exactly. Right. I mean, he's one of the people, I mean, um, I don't know, man. I mean, that's a tough one too. I, there's so many, uh, there's so many great, you know, one of the people who, uh, that I, I got a chance to dine with one time, it was more more fun than I could tell you, it was George Burns. Uh, I can imagine. Well, well, oh, my God. I mean, to sit at a table with George Burns and have a meal, it's like, oh, man, are you kidding? <laughs> and... Uh, the, one of the people that comes to mind who was a big influence on me uh, in a lot of ways was George Carlin. But I tried to talk to George backstage when I worked his show in Vegas. And he was not a comfortable person to speak with mm -hmm. like, uh, when he was not on stage. He was so comical, but he was a very, he was a very uh, uptight kind of a guy. A lot, I think a lot of comics are. Yeah. They tend to be... Uh, not the nicest people in the world when they're not doing their act. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, you know, it's a hard, you know, uh, Blue Mitchell for one person was one of the most amazing people I've ever spent time with in my entire life. I was so close to that man. Our birthdays were a week apart kind of, and uh, we were infamous for hanging Blue and Shoe. Bill Holman wrote Blue and Shoe to feature the two of us with Louis Belson's band. And I, I, I've written many times. I said, you know, hanging with Blue was great. We used to go here dizzy and we go, I'm Carmen McCray, Sarah, Sarah Vaughn. We had jazz clubs together and we were always having to watch out for police too because we were always getting high in the car. We were always smoking something or, some, you know, doing something. And, and I have given all of that up now, but, you know, yeah. Blue was just like one of, one of the greatest people in the world for me. And dizzy too. I love hanging out with Dizzy Gillespie. He's my daughter's godfather. Oh, I didn't know so, that. 
Well, that would be some great, great conversation at dinner. Uh, okay, next question. Lacquer plated or raw? What's that? Lacquer plated or raw? Uh, lacquer. Okay. What's your favorite quote? My favorite quote? Yes. God, almighty, I don't know where to go on that one because I have, I have a, I have about a thirteen-page uh, document in my computer that's quotes. Oh. I collect them, uh, aphorisms and quotes and things like that, you know. But you can send me the list later. Yeah, I can't think. I mean, it's just too. Hang on, hang on. All right, here's one for you. This this should be an easy one. Uh, what's your greatest fear? Well, I sit, right now. I have, after watching what happened at the Capitol building, I'm afraid. My fear is that our society doesn't go in that direction with all of the crime and and guns and and shit like that. I mean, that is just the sickest, saddest, heartbreaking, most heartbreaking thing I think I've, I've ever seen. I I hate all kinds of, I just have a fear that our society is going to go down instead of up. You know, I've yeah. got my fingers crossed with Kamala and, and Uncle Joe, you know, and it's just, I just hope that people educate themselves and start to chill out a little bit, you know, <laughs> take a pill. Yeah. All right. Um, you could be granted any one superpower. What would it be? If I could be granted one superpower. Yeah. Any superpower. Wow. If I could, if what I, if I would given the keys to the city, I would, completely revise the educational system. That would be the first target for me because with that, if I could revise the educational system, we'd have some hope for the future and all of what I just told you about my fears and all of that shit would go away. I go away. Yeah. Well, there you go. There's the answer to the problem. We got to give Bobby the keys of the city. Um, what aspect of trumpet playing do you think is the most overrated? High register. Mm, okay. And what aspect do you think is the most underrated? Honest jazz playing. Yeah. Uh, you are granted the ability to go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice about music. What would it be? Well, I think the, the only thing that I, I don't regret, I, I mean, I've had some rough periods in my career but not anything that are really horrible i think the the dumbest thing i've ever done that's affected my trumpet playing to this very day was and i mentioned it earlier to you is smoking cigarettes that's the one thing i would like to change in my youth i started at 10 years old and my stepfather said just don't ask me for any money for cigarettes well cigarettes were 10 cents a pack a carton of cigarettes cost a dollar yeah pick up Coke bottles on the street for two cents a piece. I can pick up five of them. I got a pack of cigarettes. And if I, that's the one thing I, I don't regret the drugs that I took. I don't regret some of the idiotic things that I did here and there. I mean, I've been cruel to people in some cases, a real asshole at times, you know, but I've overcome that and changed those things, you know, mm -hmm. But the fucking cigarettes was the dumbest thing that it's all of the problems that I have health wise and everything that's caused me to have to retire, not travel, not play, do the things that I love the most. It's all directly related to cigarette smoking. So that was the that was the worst part of my my life. You know? OK, no, nope. that is wonderful advice, So. If you're young and you're thinking about smoking or old and smoking, put them down. Um, all right, final question for you, Bobby. Um, what do you want your legacy to be? Probably with the honesty about teaching and stuff like that, that, that I hope that I can, you know, I'm not going to be able to change. I'm not stupid and, uh, uh, you know, 
I, I can't change the world here, but I hope that if they look back in and say, what did he leave us? You know, I'm not, I'm not like a world-class improviser or anything like that. You know, I mean, I'm not going to leave a legacy as a trumpet player, as an improviser. I hope it's more for some of the things regarding putting some truth into the pedagogy of trumpet teaching and stuff like that, trying to make it possible for kids to get the right information and, and have a good, clean, successful pathway towards developing as a as a as a true creative artist instead of just sitting there competing for first chair and seeing who can play the highest note and you know all of the crap that goes with the with the egotistical crap that goes with trumpet playing and stuff you know I mean it's, it's, it's I hate you know I have a towel, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but I have a little towel I carry in my trumpet case. And it says, if you hold it up, it says low C on it. And I got a bunch of these towels in England many years ago. And it, what it is, is for a, a, a beer, Marston's beer, low calorie, low C. Oh, uh, okay. And it says shape up to low C on the thing. I got a bunch of them. I gave one to Maynard. He had it in his case until the day he died. And I, sometimes when I tell students, you know, they come to me and they show me that double C, that double C, you know, I want to get that, you know, my gold chains and my well-oiled chest and my, you notice my biceps and all this. And I say, well, let me hear you play a low C. And they go, low C, man, I'm the lead player, man. I don't play no low C, man. It's not that important. I said, well, it's on my towel. It's got to be important. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is that? <laughs> but I, if, I, I tell them, I says, if I hear you play a low C, I can tell if you're going to be able to play the double C. I can tell from your how you approach the lower register whether you're going to be able to get up there or you're going to shut down as you try to get up there. If you, if I can tell from a way a guy plays the the middle register of his horn, whether he's got an upper register available to him, I can tell immediately by way he does his air, by way he controls his aperture, by his attention to uh, quality of sound resonance and overtones in his sound. If he doesn't do those right, he's not getting up there. Mm -hmm. He'll pitch and shut down before he gets anywhere. All the stuff, you know. So oh, that's that's awesome. And like I said, Bobby, I could talk to you for days uh, about. Uh, I about me too with you. You know, I, I yeah. So and this is great. And you know, I, I will go ahead and just say this for the record. I know they're going to. Some of you may be a little disappointed that we didn't talk more. How do you play a double C? Uh, but you know, this, this is all about understanding the drives and the motivations behind people, because I firmly believe that it's the way you approach life that dictates the way you're going to approach your horn. And if you really want to understand a player and, and what they're able to do, you've got to understand them as a person. And it's about a lot more than just, you know, which technical study and which mouthpiece you use. So I want to thank you for being so open and so honest about so many things. And uh, I hope that we can have a, another conversation at some point and just, you know, off the record, even just, uh, you know, catching up and, and uh, having a couple of drinks and, uh, and maybe a nice uh, Brazilian steakhouse somewhere, lots of uh, red meat. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things I like to, to end off in saying uh, is that uh, one of the most important things for a person to try to strive for in their their process of learning to play is humility, because in the in the lack of humility, no learning can occur. You know, the first thing in the, in order for you to learn and produce change and improvement in your playing. You can't sit there with a whole bunch of attitude of like arrogance and art. Anytime you put arrogance up there, that's a sign of insecurity. It's first semester psychology, you know. Right. But the you not I'm not talking about self degradation. Oh, I'm just a piece of crap, you know. That's I don't want to hear that. But the thing about it is, 
humble means respectful and not arrogant and not, I must be this, I must be first chair. I must, I want to be like Wayne Bergeron or I want to be like, you know, oh, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Just one Wayne Bergeron is enough. Just how about you? Yeah. You know, be humble enough to find yourself, you know, don't be arrogant about shit and, you know, quit, you know, you don't have to date the prettiest girl in school. She's probably going to give you some disease anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, man, Jose, I love you, man. All right. I love you too, Bobby. So thank you very much. And thank you for hanging with us today. And as always, peace and slide grease. We out. Hey, thank you so much for hanging with us today. This podcast is all about creating connection through our mutual love for the trumpet life. I hope that you learned a few things about today's guest and had some laughs along the way. Don't forget to give us a review. We love those five-star ratings. And please share this podcast with your friends. We want to see our hang grow for show. Have a suggestion for a future topic or a guest? Hit me up at thetrumpetgurus at gmail.com. Our opening theme was written and performed by Lexi Signor, and all other music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. So in the words of W.C. Handy, life is like a trumpet. If you don't put anything into it, you don't get anything out. So go out there and let your trumpet sound, and I'll see you at the next hang.